like to talk to you a bit about the investment envoy work and, and how I feel about it and so forth. Uh, many of you know that I used to run Standard Bank for 13 years. Lots of did a big deal in China. Just to put it in context, things following on from the last, that deal at the time in 2008 was was five billion dollar investment by uh, a Chinese bank into Standard Bank. So it sort of puts the 100 billion in context. You know that was one big deal. So these things are possible. Um, yeah. So so that's I come at, come at it from that perspective. I was. I mean, just a little per some personal stuff in the beginning. I was, uh, I, I retired uh, as an executive and I was sort of converting into becoming a non-executive. Um, I'm back as Deputy Chairman of Standard Bank and I'm Chairman of Liberty. Um, and, uh, and now I'm, I'm, I'm really back in harness in a big way uh, in, a, in a different capacity. But I'll, I'll explain why I felt it was the right thing to do. You know, when we were sitting as a family in December 2017 down at the coast and the ANC were having the conference, uh, I said to my family, you know, I really, really hope that Cyril Ramaphosa is going to, to make it, but I just don't see how he can with, you know, the, the, the power of incumbency and the power of patronage. How do the, call it the good guys, <laughs> win against the bad guys? Um, and it just seemed impossible. But somehow it happened, uh, and whatever coalitions and, and deals were done to make it happen, um, in my mind it was a miracle, uh, because I think it's clear that, and it's very clear now, that if we'd had another five years of, of the same sort of approach to the economy and governance and so on, South Africa would have been a failed state. Uh, and there's no doubt in my mind about, about that. So, so uh, you know, um, it, it, it was a miracle, and, uh, but, you know, we've got a, a, struggling, a struggling economy. And so my own view was just, you know, I'll, I'll, I must help. Uh, I believe in this country. My family are here. My children are here in order to make it work. Uh, and so I was in Davos last year, uh, and, and uh, uh, Cyril Ramaphosa was there as then, the, not, not yet the president of the country, um, but the whole mood and tone had changed. Suddenly everyone wanted to talk to us. Uh, we were in demand. Uh, people weren't just being polite to us. They really wanted to, to talk to us. And uh, at one of those dinners, I had a brief interaction with, uh, with the president and he said, I need your help. And I said, sure. Uh, and I sat and waited for three months and I was terrified because I thought I might have to go and fix a state-owned enterprise or something, which, <laughs> 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 which would have uh, put the fear of God into me. So... Um, anyway, so when the call came uh, and uh, it was to try and raise money, it was something I knew something about. I'm an investment banker by background, so it, 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 it appealed and, and I was very happy to do it. And I think you're all aware that the four of us are doing it uh, as, as national service. We don't get paid for what we do. It's just to try and help to my mina. Um, the thing that really struck me in my conversation with him at the time was... I said, what are the most important things for you? And he just said, it's, it's growth and jobs. Um, and now for a president who's dealing with all the issues of our country, which are myriad and are many more than that, for him to say, you know, the centrality of what's got to be done is growth and jobs, uh, to me was, was, was critical and I was happy then to proceed. He actually made that exact same remark. There was a booster session about two or three weeks ago uh, where at the end he was asked the same question, you know, what is your key priority straight after the elections? And he said growth and jobs. And so, of course, we've got to deal with inequality, poverty, and all these other things in our country, but you can't do it without, without growth and jobs. And, and I think our president certainly understands that uh, absolutely and exactly. And the fact that, you know, we are, we are trying to return to, you know, conventional views of how you grow economies, what made countries successful, etc., rather than some of the, uh, you know, more outrageous uh, approaches to certain things that we'd seen in, in, the prior, in the prior years. And also an appreciation of the private sector. You know, <laughs> uh, the state can't, the government can't create jobs. It's impossible. Uh, it has to be done by the private sector. Uh, of course, the state can do, state can do, do some of it, but, but it's the private sector that drives the economy. It's irrefutable. It can be demonstrated quite easily. And so therefore, you've got to appreciate the private sector, which in the prior 10 years, 
there was really a disdain uh, for the private sector, I would say. Um, so, that, so that was kind of uh, the background. Um, so then we had Ramaphoria, uh, which quickly turned into reality, um, and, 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 and there we found ourselves. I mean, to me, the simple little thing that also seems so obvious, you know, our growth rate tracking around the 1% range, uh, and Sub-Saharan Africa is growing at 3 plus, you know, so it, it tells you that there's like 2% of growth that's just our own fault, you know, it's a, we've shot ourselves in the foot, it's, uh, we should be growing at a much faster rate, uh, um, and, and so it should be relatively easy, one would think, uh, to get the growth rate uh, up. I mean, you can't do it quickly, but it should be relatively easy if we just, you know, start doing a bunch of the, the basics uh, correctly and stopping the corruption and theft and, and so on, because these are all deltas that move in a positive direction quite quickly. So the, the question was, how do you capitalize on this political dividend that we, we had? Um, and, and when you think about it, there's only one lever to pull, because uh, the, the government can't, can't launch a big, uh, you know, post-Great Depression expenditure program. The SOEs can't launch big expenditure, capital expenditure programs. The consumer is relatively, relatively stretched, so you can't get a consumer boom going. Dropping interest rates would be irresponsible, et cetera, et cetera. Unlikely to have an emerging markets boom that's going to lift uh, all, you know, boat that's going to, tie that's going to lift all boats. Um, you know, so we have to pull up ourselves up by our bootstraps, and, and, and there is only one lever left when you go through that, and it's, it's, it's private sector investment, fixed investment, uh, both foreign and local. That's the only lever that, that, that we really have to pull. So, um, you know, uh, there are the, the, the multiply effects, uh, you know, it, if, you, if you spend a rand on, on, on fixed investment, it does have a multiplier effect of something like two and a half times over a, over a period. So it is the way to do it. China has, you know, has, a, has a ratio of investment to GDP of around about 50%. We were in the mid-20s, we dropped below 20. So it's clear, you know, this is something that we can do and must do, and so therefore put all the effort into it, and what have we got to do to get the investment going? In my mind, all investment is good. We need portfolio flows, we need, we need uh, you know, all kinds of investment. Uh, of course, the best investment is, is uh, an export facility that employs lots of people. Uh, you know, that's the best kind of investment, uh, but we shouldn't, beggars shouldn't be choosers, we should be delighted about any kind of, of investment. And people tend to think of new factories, it's actually just capex, capital expenditure. Companies, you know, spending more than they spent the year before. So we've got this target of $100 billion, but actually it's a little bit irrelevant. It's the delta that matters, it's the change. So what did people spend uh, last year? In, in, in renewing or, or building new facilities and, 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 uh, and, and capital projects and what, what is being spent in, in, in the years ahead. But it's great to have this 100 billion target because people understand it, focus on it, and you can report uh, against it and, and so on. But, but the real issue is, is the change rather than the absolute. Um, we've set ourselves, you know, thought process that it should be 50-50, 50% foreign, 50% uh, local. Why is the local so important? Well, the first thing any foreign investor pretty much says to you when it comes to fixed investment, I, I think there are lots of contrarian short-term investors deciding, you know, that our bond bond yields are going to go up or down, uh, who might take a contrarian view. But but in fixed investment, the foreigners always want to know what the locals are doing. You know, they want to follow the locals. Would be a theme, and another theme would be. We want to benefit from your growth. It's not our responsibility to create the growth. You know, so uh, foreign investors want to come and make money here uh, because our economy is growing. I mean, that's the first thing you look at pretty much. Every time we bought a bank anywhere in Africa, the first thing you look at is what are the GDP growth rates? What are the, you know, what are the, what are the, what are the potential customer numbers? How, how much can the, how underbanked is it, etc. So, it's it's the growth that is is key, and and so therefore we have to create that growth. You can't expect foreigners to create it for us. We've spoken to hundreds of companies in this process uh, for, in, for Envoys. We make notes of our meetings, we convey them through to the, the presidency and so on, depending on what they are. But So what are the sorts of things you've found? Uh, and you heard some of it earlier from Seamus, um, but I think it's a little bit more, there, there are a few more factors. The first thing is political stability. People want to know <laughs> that 
they can bank on some sort of stable political uh, environment, particularly where, it, where this is a country, it's not like, well, it's become much more controversial in, in, in a lot of developed countries, but the policy issues are not minor, they are major, the policy differences between, call it, the different factions of, of the ANC. So they want to know that there's going to be some political stability which will, will you know, continue for like a 10-year horizon. If you're building a factory, you build a computer model and, and it, ha it has to run for 15, 20 years and you want to put inputs in there and you can't have uh, a whole bunch of important variables that are going to be up for review every couple of years because there's been some change in the, in, in, in the ANC. Um, but there is no quick fix to this. The whole question of the rule of law and the constitution I think is, is, is fundamental and it's one of our strong points as we all know. But I think for me in my discussions around land, which has you know, gone down in the, in, the, uh, in the whole sort of order of importance. The land thing was much more about, is this the thin end of the, end of the wedge that's going to be changing the constitution rather than so much about uh, expropriation without compensation. Foreign investors coming to look to build a factory or expand their plant here are not fearful that they're going to be expropriated without compensation. So it's more, the, it's more is this the beginning of something else? So that is, is fundamental. Corruption is, is huge, particularly as it was so big in, in our country. There's corruption in all the our competitive markets in Brazil, Russia, China, these places, there's corruption as well. Um, but uh, we, ours had reached a sort of an unprecedented and brazen scale. And, and a lot of foreign investors that I've spoken to have been hurt by it. You know. They've been hurt by it because they were given a contract or they lost out on a contract because uh, you know, one of the other, 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 other players paid a bribe uh, or they were halfway through their contract and things were taken away or whatever. So, so the, the corruption thing is... is, is, is creates huge uncertainty, particularly for the blue chip kind of companies of the world. They hate it, you know, so, so we have to deal with it. And of course, if we deal with it it, 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 it saves the country a huge amount of money as well. A lot of it is also just a, about an appeal for sensible policies, you know, and we had for such a long time, we had silly things that were hurting us. You know, the visa thing was crazy and it still is not, not, not nearly sorted. The mining charter was, for how long did that take? You know, you know, I went to the mining in Darba two weeks ago. The discussion about so South Africa is back on the map in a mining sense again. Uh, all because we got a charter, and it may not be perfect, but we got a charter on the table. And, uh, and so that was, was silly. You know, the whole allocation of spectrum uh, uh, to enable um, you know, growth in, in, in broadband and data and so on was, was hanging for, for ages. Uh, the MPDRA, the, we, you know, that, that legislation was, 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 was confusing foreign investors. So there was a whole bunch of sort of just policies that just had to be sensible, not wonderful, but just you know, get them done and, and we at least starting to do that. The generic things like land, like uh, black economic, broad-based black economic empowerment comes up as a huge issue, you know. Um, and and as many of you know, I was I was one of the authors of the of the financial uh, sector charter, so I, I know about the difficulty of of creating these frameworks as long before legislation was introduced. But we have now got ourselves into such a complex kind of world where uh, Don Don Gibbs, the previous American ambassador, U.S. ambassador to South Africa, was out here uh, when Obama was out here, and there was a meeting with the president and various other. Uh, big corporate American corporates, and and he said, Mr. President, you know, when I retired or left South Africa and went back to the U.S., um, I formed a consultancy to help American companies deal with BEE. He said I shouldn't have a job, but I said I just can't cope because nobody can get to grips with uh, with with the detail. Now it may have been a bit of an exaggeration, but but it is so complex, and we've kept changing. So this is another ca one of those cases where we've got to put a peg in the ground say that's what it is and move on. We can't keep adding and changing to it if we expect uh, foreign investment, certainly. And the health sector is another sort of generic thing which is bubbling and it's, it's, it's aggro and we don't seem to be making progress. And you've, you've got many world-class health companies in this country, hospital groups, drug manufacturers, discovery, et, et cetera. And, and they, we, seem not to, we seem to be sort of almost at war in that space, which is which is not healthy, so that that's something that needs solving. So there's, I think there's generally just an appeal to simplify complexity, 
skills and education is an interesting thing because on the one hand, we've got very good skills. We don't have enough necessarily very good skills, but, but you know, there's a whole ecosystem around Stellenbosch of, of, um, of IT uh, and tech startups and so on on the go. Um, people often say that you, know, you can get really, really good uh, technical skills in South Africa. The question is, you know, can you get enough? And then, of course, on the other side, you've got the challenges that we're all aware of, of, of how many people are not well educated. Um, the SOE point is is obviously critical, and it's it's at two levels, right? Uh, it's one thing is you've got to fix the SOE, get the governance right, get them sorted out. But more importantly, for most people that are looking at fixed investments, you've got to get the tariffs right. You know, it matters what the tariff, the rail tariff is, the port tariff is, the electricity tariff is, because that's the cost into your into your enterprise. So. So how do you fix the SOEs but at the same time actually reduce prices because our prices are not competitive globally uh, anymore. We used to have lowest price of various things. We don't, we don't anymore. So that, it's, a real, it's a real challenge. Eskim has shot up uh, the, shot up the uh, charts, obviously, in, in recent times, and, and it's, it's kind of center stage. Um, and clearly, you know, if, 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 you, if you haven't got electricity, you can't expect to have an industrialized economy. People aren't going to invest if they're really fearful of, of electricity supply. So we have to get through this Eskom thing uh, as, best, as best we can. And it's not just the financial problem. You can write off pretty much all of Eskom's debt. It still loses m money on a day-to-day -day basis. So it has to change its cost structure, absolutely. Uh, and more fundamentally, I think, you need the skills, you need people in Eskom who can who can really do the technical stuff in terms of running power stations and and so on. And, 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 and certainly, from what I hear, we've, we just haven't got enough of those skills and you're not going to find them in South Africa. You're going to have to bring them in from, from elsewhere with all the, the political issues that go with that. Um, and then you have the industry-specific issues. Every industry has its policies and people try and use us to lobby, which we don't we don't do. We don't get involved in, in becoming lobbyists for particular industry issues. Our main job is to feed and to unblock things. So whenever we hear of a problem that sounds like it's a genuine problem and it affects a sector rather than one company, we will uh, get that into the presidency. Um, and, and and we've had a lot of successes. Uh, we've had a lot of successes. Typically, if, if we phone a minister, the, we do get a reply, and, and they will send somebody to come and look at things. So, so I think uh, that has been good. There is Invest SA, which is in the DTI, which is also helps unblock small things. Um, and uh, and so, so yeah, so we are in a sense free agents and, and roaming agents because we have no authority, we've got no power, we're not a threat to any minister. All we can tell them is this is what we're hearing. This seems to be a problem. Can we fix it? And if the answer is no, we might well then, through the presidency, say, well, actually, it's, we think it is a problem and we think we should fix it, even if the minister disagrees. Um, but, but then it's outside, out of our hands. I think we're very lucky as South Africa, something that's sort of underappreciated. Um, local companies, the private sector, has got very strong balance sheets. The big companies in South Africa, barring a few, are very well structured, strong balance sheets. So, there is a capacity to spend. Uh, it's not about whether there's been an investment strike in cash. On, they, they can borrow. So they've got a strong banking sector as well. So the capacity is there to, uh, to, uh, to do it if companies you know, believe that it's the right thing to do. There's been a fantastic initiative which Nick Benadell uh, from, from here was part of the, the public-private growth initiative which was, was Nick and Rolf Mayer and, and, and Johan van Sale, uh, who was Toyota, who's now running a big chunk of Toyota worldwide, essentially looking at the Japanese model and saying, you know, if you look at Jap Japan's success, so much of it was sectors getting together and sectors working with MITI and the government and, 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 and creating plans and, and getting policy that works for the, for the industry. And a, a whole bunch of important sectors in South Africa were completely disorganized. Of course, you've got regulated sectors like banking and the, the motor, motor industry, which are well organized, but, but we now have, uh, just to give you some sort of sense, there have been presentations, automotive, agricultural, chemicals, manufacturing, tourism, renewable energy, uh, construction, pharmaceutical, mining, retail, ICT, health. All of these have come together under this initiative 
uh, did a presentation to, to the cabinet and the president uh, at that VUSA event uh, a few weeks ago. Uh, and looking at what is the partnership that's required between government, what are your five-year plans, uh, how much jobs can be created, um, challenges that obstruct growth, and what are the things, you know, how much more would you invest if type of thing. So, so that's a really, really positive initiative and it's got some momentum. It's got nothing to do specifically with us as envoys, but, but it's, it's kind of in parallel. So when you look at the, the foreign companies, another great sort of good set of good fortune that we have is that um, we've got thousands of foreign companies in this country and it's, it's by dint of history and, and our colonial legacy and all that sort of stuff, but it's a, it's a massive um, attribute. Now we're talking about China and so on, um, and I'm pretty involved in all that, but the reality is if you look at the stock of fixed investment in South Africa, foreign fixed investment in South Africa, 78% of it comes from Europe, i.e. Europe and the UK. 78% of what's on the ground comes out of Europe and, and the UK. And another statistic is 80% of it, 80% of fixed investment comes from the US, UK, Germany, Switzerland, and, and the Netherlands. Um, so that's what's here already. And if you're trying to encourage investment, it's much easier to work with what's already here and try and get people to invest more uh, to expand or whatever than to, to try and come in, you know, out of the blue and build a brand new plant or factory. So we have to work with, with, with that and it's, it's a great blessing and the ambassadors in those countries have been fantastic. You'll have seen the who are in the newspaper the other day, but they account, those ambassadors <laughs> speak for 80% of the fixed investment in foreign fixed investment in this country or FDI. Um, China and Japan are critical, as, 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 as you heard earlier, where we talked about China. So we talked about FOCAC, uh, which is the, the big initiative with all the African governments, 45 countries in, in, in Beijing last year, with, with by just by good luck with President Ramaphosa as the leader of the African delegation, just by rotation it happened to be, but it was fantastic for us. Uh, this year we've got TCAD, which is the Tokyo Inter uh, International Conference on African Development in August. We, we, again, every African president will be in Tokyo. Um, and uh, so, so what's interesting is as China has been pushing into Africa, the, the Japanese definitely feel left behind and are trying to play catch up. And so there's a lot of interest uh, from, from Japanese countries in Africa, but, 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 but in their case, interesting enough, uh, a huge preference to first start in South Africa. They feel, feel relatively safe, feel really, you know, because of our infrastructure and all those things. Most, almost all Japanese companies would have their, sort of call it their, their Africa head office here. This whole thing of Africa head offices is a huge opportunity as well, uh, whatever you want to call it, um, because of our infrastructure and so on, um, and legal system, contractual, you know, able to enforce contracts, all these things. It's an obvious place and it really annoys me when I hear of uh, big, big multinationals headquartered, the, the African headquarters in Dubai or in, in Nairobi. It, it makes no sense, but it's because of some of the stuff we've done, you know. A simple example, if you are, if you are GE or operating around Africa, who happen to at the moment to have their Africa headquarters in, in Nairobi, uh, who do you want in your Africa headquarters? You want people from the US, from head office. You want people from all your African countries in your Africa head office. And we say, no, no, you must employ South Africans. <laughs> but actually, if you want to set up a head office structure, you don't need South Africans in, in your head office. You know? And the benefit of having the head office here is enormous, the spin-offs that then go with it. So, so it's kind of things we just haven't thought about properly. Um, um, at its simplest, on policy, it's trying to encourage, which the president does all the time, it's, it's trying to encourage uh, um, people drafting legislation and so on to look at everything through a growth lens primarily. You know, we've got lots of lenses that we have to look at things through in this country, but, but if you can primarily say, well, if I look at this through a growth lens, is, is this policy going to hinder or hurt growth? Um, and unfortunately, if you look back over the last number of years, a lot of what we've put in place doesn't pass the growth lens test. So then we had our conference in October. Um, we're gonna have a conference again every year now, uh, but we had it in October. Uh, and I think for the first time around, it was an unbelievable success. Uh, $20 billion of, of real deals were announced there. Um, they had to be audited, checked. It, you couldn't just stand up and, and you know, th th we had a whole process around that. 
some of those things had already been decided beforehand, so it was a, it was a little bit of a gilded lily, perhaps. But nevertheless, you know, there was, there was a lot of interesting and strong commitments made there, and it wasn't all sort of old, old companies. Uh, you know, you had Amazon Web Services, as, as an example, putting up a big cloud computing facility in, in Cape Town, um, some, some interesting new mining uh, propositions, despite all the adverse noise and so on. Uh, the sectors that the sorry, so there's 20 billion of, of of real stuff announced, and then we've got commitments of another 35 billion in 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 a country sense, 10 from from Saudi, 10 from um, 10 from the UAE, and 15 from China. But we have to find those projects. So the Saudis would like a refinery. So we have to, con but they committed. But we've got to find the refinery and and, and in enable them to to build it. They want to also invest in energy projects. So the commitment's there, but the actual projects have got to be, 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 be found and the work's got to be done. But, but, but that's also a non-trivial kind of um, commitment. Yeah, this, the big sectors that the government's pushing, uh, not necessarily always well, exactly well thought through, but it's agricultural processing, mining and minerals, manufacturing, transport infrastructure, energy, water infrastructure, ICT, including business process outsourcing, tourism, uh, and, and venture capital. So those are the areas that the government would dearly like to see investment in. But as I said earlier, uh, any investment is good and we're just you know, trying to facilitate it. Uh, as we talk to the sovereign wealth funds of the world, um, I happen to sit on the advisory council of the Chinese sovereign wealth fund, uh, CRC. But as we talk to the, the Tamasex and, and, and GIC and these uh, from, from Singapore and, and the other big sovereign wealth funds, um, and the asset managers here as well. Um, these investors are looking for projects that they can invest in, and they're happy to take long-term views. Our, our problem as a country is that we just don't have a list of, you know, prioritized, call it shovel-ready, uh, bankable, projects, you know, this toll road, this dam, this, uh, uh, this pipeline, etc. We, we just don't have that. And, and, and so we lack this project book and, and the money for that is there. These sovereign wealth funds would happily give, say, I give, give me $100 million, I'll put $100 million and just give me a, a thing that shows me what the expected returns are that I can model and do some sensitivities on. Uh, but they're just interested in a return over 10 or 15 years uh, in dollars and uh, but the, the money is there. Our own asset managers also have a complete underweight position in inf infrastructure assets uh, and longer term uh, sort of private equity type assets. Uh, most of our pension funds are, are, are you know, overwhelmingly, you know, in the high 90% invested uh, in bonds and listed equities just because it's, it's easy. So there's a, a huge opportunity there and we're working on that. The infrastructure fund that was announced and, and there was references again in the budget uh, at the job summit um, is the right thing and I think it'll help, but it, unfortunately it hasn't got much traction as we speak today. Um, after the conference, we, we now are now going to the, the we, we invited the top 250 companies as we could sort of identify them, the 150 biggest listed companies and the 100 biggest unlisted companies, um, of which many of obviously are foreign owned, uh, the Volkswagens and the Mercedes Benzes and the Siemenses and so on. Um, to that conference. Uh, the conference, by the way, was a huge success at an emotional level. By the end of that evening, where Jack Ma ca came, came and addressed the conference in the evening, and, and there was a real sense of, you know, that we, we kind of getting back on track with the CEOs that I was speaking to, people saying we've really got hope again, which is all you really need to, to persuade people to to seriously consider investing in the, in the country again. Standard Bank, of which I'm associated with, has been investing far more in the rest of the continent than here. Why? Just because the, the returns are, look better. You know? so, uh, but, but once things start changing, um, uh, there's a backlog, actually, and that's something that's in our favour as well. Companies have to spend because there's been a sort of a backlog over the last number of years that's built up. Um, so we are now going out and asking those 250 companies to disclose to us their capital expenditure plans for the next, for the next th three or four years, I forget, uh, compared, to, 
compared to last year so that we can see the deltas. And maybe some companies are going to show us that their CapEx plans are lower, but at least we'll know and we'll be able to engage with them and understand and, and say, well, if, we, if what changed or what would, would change to make it look uh, better. So we should have that information, which will obviously aggregate and not disclose individual companies. A lot of people say to me, well, what about uh, you know, people investing outside of South Africa? We can't stop that, and I think it would be a great tragedy if we were worried about that. You know, we've got to make South Africa an attractive place for, for, to invest in. The fact that uh, companies are, you know, we should be very proud of the fact that a lot of companies are doing good things um, elsewhere in the world. And then just to close, the one great blessing we've got is our president. This man in the, on the global arena is a rock star. You know? uh, I was with, at Davos with him this time. My job was to get global CEOs in front of him. It's just impossible. There are just so many people trying to see him, politicians and business people. You know? So we have got a blessing here that there is this, this person that's got you know, amazing stature, personality, um, and, and he's very attuned and, and open to talking to business people, and when he meets business people, he talks to them about business. He doesn't talk to them about, or about politics if it's, if it's relevant, but, but he doesn't, he, you know, he talks about the actual issues, uh, and he's well briefed and well prepared. So we've got that, which is an incredible asset for us to try and capitalize on. So yeah, uh, despite the sort of challenges and the realities that we all heard about in the budget today, uh, and so on, uh, I must say I'm, I'm increasingly positive, and the CEOs that I talk to uh, are, also.